Oh yeah, it's mind pump time. All right, today's giveaway, MAPS Strong. This is a strongman-inspired workout program. You build good muscle, good strength, some agility, believe it or not. Really works the posterior chain, the back and the back side. This is why a lot of people love this program, especially people who want to get a nice-looking back and a nice-looking butt. This program will do it for you. So we're going to give it away for free. Here's how you can enter. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and click on notifications. You got to do all those things. If you do all that and we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MapStrong. Also, one more thing before we get to this incredible podcast. Um, we are right now offering three workout bundles for three different types of people and we discounted them heavily. The first bundle is for beginners. The second one is for those of you that are intermediate. And the third one is for those of you that are advanced. Each bundle is nine months of planned out workouts, nine months of exercise demos, blueprints, everything you need to get into incredible shape. Okay, so pick one of the ones that works best for you, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and get started. And again, they're discounted heavily. So if you're interested, head over to mapsjanuary.com. Also, if you just want to try one MAPS program, I want to see what this is all about, do MAPS Anabolic. To help you out, we put MAPS Anabolic 50% off right now. You can get that at mapsred.com. You just got to use the code January50 for 50% off. All right, here comes the show. Time for some truth. If you skip leg day, your arms aren't going to grow as much either. All right, let's talk about this a little bit. I remember the first time I read that somewhere. I thought that was an inch. You know, I don't remember. I think it was like a, um, I feel like it was a T Nation article that I read that where it was like, it, the article was titled something like, um, you know, hit a plateau or your arms won't grow, then um, work on your squat. Yeah. And it was like, what? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that blew my mind. So so here's the science behind it, right? So, and by the way, this has been anecdotally observed in uh, strength building and muscle bodybuilding world for a long time. I mean, there were articles written in the 70s that would talk about how adding weight to the squat would get your arms bigger. Or if you gained muscle in your legs, you would notice that you get bigger arms. So people have observed this for a long time. What does this mean? Like, how do we, uh, you know, explain this scientifically? Well, there are studies that show, great studies, by the way, where if somebody has, let's say, an, uh, an arm that's broken or an arm that's incapacitated, it will atrophy less if you work the arm that's available. In other words, mm -hmm. if I break my left arm, I'm better off training my right arm because it actually prevents muscle loss from happening in my left arm. So, What's happening here, and the way it's explained, is that there is an, a localized acute effect from resistance training. In other words, the muscle you train is going to get most of the muscle building effects, but there's a systemic effect yeah. that happens you, as well. Do you think this is all attributed to the CNS, or do you think there's other factors at play? Ooh, that's a good question. Or is it just the irradiation effect? That, which would be the CNS, Which right? would be the yeah. CNS. So it's, yeah, I mean, in terms of it also being able to stabilize and have that isometric contraction, uh, I, I'm sure would play a factor in that. Because I, 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 after I read that, the way that I would explain it to like a client and I wouldn't do it exactly this way, but let me, I'll refine it with your analogy because I like it so much. And I've brought up your analogy many times on the show since you've brought it up because I think it's one of the best analogies and I think it, it works here also, which is your um, amplifier and speaker analogy. Mm -hmm. And it's a good example of... I don't use any of your analogy. <laughs> come up with random ones. <laughs> You're like ramp water. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's just so... Uh, because this is hard to explain to somebody, yes. right? It's like really like, huh, squatting more. But if you can explain the the amp and the speaker analogy, then it does make sense. It's like, oh, even though you're not directly working on the speaker, like for example, or one of the speakers, you're building the amplifier. Yeah. And of course, if you build a bigger, better, stronger amplifier, it is going to directly affect yeah. all the other muscles or speakers. And so I think that's how I would explain it to a client is like, even though we may not be working on these specific speakers, right now by you squatting it's squatting contributes amplifier. so much to uh building a uh, i don't know the more sophisticated cns you maybe you'd say or a, a stronger cns yeah. signal yeah because of uh the, it's difficulty right so and that carryover bleeds into the other muscle yeah, the groups. systemic effect is very interesting right there's a lot of things that happen one is what you're talking about then there's this like general you know, increase in muscle protein synthesis. There's these general changes in hormone levels. Myostatin generally gets affected um, as well, not just uh, acutely or locally, but also kind of systemically. Now, I, I like to explain it from an evolutionary standpoint. I think the body 
it it to become super imbalanced is evolutionarily disadvantageous. So although the body will allow you mm. to build a certain amount of imbalance in order to make you better at whatever you're attempting to do a lot of, too much of an imbalance starts to become a detriment, right? And I think that the the uh, the systemic muscle building effect is larger with larger muscle groups and smaller with smaller muscle groups. So if I work my biceps, I'll get a localized muscle building effect to the biceps and I'll get some small systemic effect overall. Mm -hmm. But if it's like my lats or my quads or my glutes or, or big muscle groups, I mean, if you're working out your legs, you're working out half of your body, you get that localized effect, but then you get this, again, this systemic effect. And so when people skip body parts, they're actually, not only are they not developing the body part that they're skipping, which is most of the effect, but they're also impeding the benefits or the muscle building effects that they get, could get on other body parts. And you talk to anybody who, and I know I had clients like this where they skip leg day all the time uh -huh. and then they hired me and I'm like, look, we can't do that. I'm going to train your legs. I'm a trainer. I have integrity, so we got to do it. Yeah. And then they're they like, also gained upper body strength and mass. Yes. Yeah. And they all comment on it. Why are my, my upper body is getting stronger? My arms feel bigger. Like what's going on? I'll explain this and say, well, you know, your, your body doesn't want to be that imbalanced. So skipping leg day, yeah, your legs are small, but your arms are not as big as they could be as well. Dude, that's why I always trip on the human body it has so many of those mechanisms in place to um, prevent a lot of those imbalances from happening, or at least like kind of bring it back uh, to somewhat of a homeostasis yes. where it's it's most optimal. And like, and this is the same thing with like you know when you're in a state of, of famine, uh, you know, and you're, you're preserving calories, uh, you know, and it has all these like mechanisms in place to make sure that uh, you're utilizing, you know, the energy, the most efficient way possible. Totally. Well, if you're training free weights also, there's actually not very many, I actually can't think of any right now that are free weight. I can think of some machines, but if you're training legs, there's you're almost always incorporating upper body too. Oh, it's holding. So there's that factor too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you put 225 pounds or more on your back um, and your shoulders, your upper back, your abs and core. Yeah, it has like, to account for that load. Yeah, so it's it's getting worked. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not like a direct uh, effect, like if you were to do shoulder press or do a row or whatever like that. But it's still it's still getting worked. Yes. You know? So there's got to be some value in that. And it, right, I can't think of a free weight exercise that you don't use. Right now, you could do leg extensions, leg curls, leg press, where you where you take the upper body out of it. But most free weight, if not all free weight, lower body exercises still incorporates this, the upper body. This is one of the reasons why I think, generally speaking, people debate this all the time, uh, but I think if you were to in, if you were to interview 100 top strength conditioning and muscle building coaches, a majority, maybe not all, but a majority would say that free weights generally build more muscle and strength than machines do. And I think that's one of the reasons why, right? That free weights have you have that that localized effect, but they have more of a systemic effect because so many things are involved. You have to stabilize. You have to stand with the weight. Typically, if you're working your lower body, you're still holding the weight with your right. upper body and all that stuff. So, and, and here's another example. Um, if you if you're watching this right now, you if you have something that can measure your grip strength, go ahead and try squeezing as hard as you can while maintaining total relaxation in the rest of your body. Yeah, don't grit your teeth. Don't squeeze the other Nothing. hand. Yeah. Everything totally relaxed and just activate your grip and then try it again, even though you might even be a little fatigued from your first attempt, and then squeeze your entire body and see how much stronger you are. You'll I'm notice a 10, 15% increase in strength. By the way, you'll notice how hard it is to activate maximally while relaxing everything. It's not a natural thing. Yeah. Your body wants to turn on at CNS to generate. Oh, I don't even force. think you need something to measure. Someone right now could literally just make, relax your mouth, relax your body, squeeze your, your you hand can. and then allow yourself to grit your teeth and yep. squeeze the other hand and you can instantly feel your, your palm just get tighter. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. But the studies on like, uh, like right to left, like it's so interesting. Like you'll have like one leg totally incapacitated. So of course it's going to atrophy. They'll train the other leg and they'll compare this to groups where they don't train the other leg and they just leave them both. You lose less muscle in the leg that's not trained. Yeah. Um, it's such an interesting, but again, evolutionarily speaking, it makes perfect sense. I mean, our bodies evolved always trying to make us, help us survive. And so all of it makes sense from that standpoint. And like you mentioned, you know, famine and the metabolism adapting and uh, all that. I mean, it makes, makes absolute perfect sense, but it is interesting. And a lot of people don't, by the way, this is true for women too. You want to build big, a bigger butt and you're not working out your upper body 
You're not going to mm. build the butt that you can because you're avoiding uh, training the That's rest of your body. good point that there is a lot of my female clients that would avoid a lot of upper body exercise, especially a chest press or something like that. Yes. Yeah. It all works together. So yep. this is all very, very important. All right. I want to I wanted to talk about another very interesting observation. You know, there's these, uh, these I, I don't know what you would call them, um, not myths, but like things about being a dad. Uh, stereotypes about being a dad, right? That are hilarious. Like, <laughs> yeah. there's the dad sneeze. Yeah, yeah. Controlling the thermostat, right? Yeah. All this kind of stuff, and, and th- yelling at cars that are going too fast. Yes, and yeah. then there's this other one that is hilarious, and Adam literally is this. He, <laughs> he, he embodies it to the team. Embodies it. So yeah. it's you've ever. I'm sure you've seen the memes where it's like, you know, my dad. At 6 a.m., getting us ready for our flight at 1 p.m. And dad is like, 6 a.m., ready with the yeah. luggage. Everything. Let's go, guys. We got to yeah. go fast. We got to make sure we're in time. Don't eat the breakfast. Right. You know. This is Adam. <laughs> Traveling with Adam the car. can be so stressful because <laughs> oh my God. literally the flight. But I want a huge breakfast. The fl- stop here. No, don't stop here. Let's go to the other one. Let's get back on the freeway. Who's fucking directing us here? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> We had like, it was like it's everybody five, else's fault. Ah! We, had, we had like five yeah. hours before the plane leaves. The, the, the airport's 30 minutes away. Yeah. And we, not only can we not eat breakfast, we have to eat breakfast on a place that's on the way. And if you can't find one, then we're going to the airport. We yeah. have to be on time. I'm like, bro, we got like five hours. <laughs> What's going on? Dude, dude, the irony of this whole like thing was that our plane was totally delayed. Yeah. yeah and then we, we got, got on the reset. The and of course that happened, right? Yeah, of course exactly. that happened. <laughs> exactly. to just to prove the point of that Sal was trying to make even more. That I love we did, it too. You guys have a running it. bet too. Because uh, for a minute there, it was looking the other direction. You know what I'm saying? No, we got, we we got the clear. Just, we were clear. We got a little delay there. Then we had a belt thing go down, a little delay there. Like, you know what I'm saying? We're at Utah, which the fucking airport's ridiculous there. You have to go 45 minutes and walk across just from A to C terminal. Like... <laughs> So it was looking like you know I was I was uh, I was just on time, but no, I ended up uh, it's always, several hey, hours. It's early, literally so like you're you're in a race. So what I'm I'm trying to figure out. I'm, I'm, I mean, and, I'm kind of guilty of this too. And so. to be, I'm trying. Oh, to be, I, I am too, trying to be honest with myself, just, right? And, and say, is this a, a dad thing, or have I always been this way? And I, I can't, you know, I can't recall. I mean, I, I wasn't. I didn't travel as much with the same group of people to probably measure it well to tell you because I do know it's a pet peeve of mine to be rushing to the airport. I just I've done that's happened to me more than once in my life. Sure. Uh, yeah. Normally, when you're with your now, the irony is you're rushing five hours early. We're well, still I rushing. Feel, <laughs> I mean. I, you hear me putting the pressure on us, but I don't feel like I'm I'm rushing. I mean, you may feel that way, so maybe you felt the stress of it. But I, that's exactly why I do it, so we don't stress. So then, just like, <laughs> so when we get there and shit happens, which always happens at the airport, the airport never goes smooth. Yeah. If it does, it's like one out of ten times it goes smooth. There's always something. I mean, did it happen to Justin and I yep. flying in? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were standing there and we were way early, right? Him and I actually chose to meet at the airport yeah. instead of meeting with you guys because we heard Sal going oh doug just meet me at nine we just, I'll just we, get there 15 minutes before yeah man. like yeah. we got clear we'll just meet me right yeah. there and i look at john i'm like no nah, I'll, I'll meet the guys there dude yeah. so we got there early and we're standing there two and, machines bro yes and the first and we're like right there to get to go through the the check-in or whatever and belt breaks we're standing there for like 15 minutes then the guy tells us to go the other one that one doesn't work and the whole time justin and i are just bullshitting looking at instagram yeah. talking like not stressed all because we know we're Plenty early, so but I don't know if it's a dad thing or I've always kind of been well that early. Way. I get early because I'm the same way, right? But there's early and then there's unreasonable. Well, we okay, five hours. Come on, you got to be a little fair here too. So we got we had this checkout time at ten o'clock and we have a flight at three and and we had nothing in between, right? Yeah. So it's like if we if we I try to get our checkout time pushed to noon. If we would have done that, I would have waited at the house till noon. Sure. It's mm-hmm. not like I would have made you guys leave at 11, but we had to be out anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And my theory is we got to get out. We may as well head towards where we got to go. <laughs> so we don't run so yeah. we don't run into other things, which by the way, when we were traffic, heading to the right? breakfast spot yeah. you're all talking about right now, the uh, that was off the beaten path. It, we're, thank God we were smart enough to call, which, by the way, if I probably wasn't putting the pressure on us, we probably wouldn't have called. We probably would have drove there, showed up, <laughs> found out it was a 45-minute wait before you could sit down and eat, and then- And then only had four hours before. <laughs> because our plane got too late. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, without the delay. No. Without the delay. You had the no, delay. It's like seven no, hours. No. no, but I love it because yeah. there's the, the, the memes. Fun. Those memes exist for a reason, and I see them in myself. Like I'll see certain memes. 
Okay, like the, oh, here's a good one. Mm. Uh, uh, one minute after we start opening presents on Christmas, and it's the guy, the dad with the garbage bag. Oh, I'm definitely that guy. That's oh, me, dude. Yeah, I'm definitely that's that guy. me. That's yeah. me. As soon as it starts, get, yeah. oh no, don't open anything. Let me get yeah. the garbage bag. Yeah, yeah. We're starting. Well, I don't really have fun until everybody's like gone and like I'm done assembling everything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Like, you're like you got to assemble all the shit. You got to get everything. Like it's just like okay, I'm not, I'm not having fun yet. You yeah. know, <laughs> you know. Speaking of our flights, um, you know, I was reminded on this flight on uh how i know that masks don't work i didn't need to wait for all these studies to come out yeah. and to tell us and stuff like that like i knew this before because i had been flying earlier in the year and i was reminded again sitting here because motherfuckers farting on the plane do not think <laughs> i can still taste it yeah <laughs> i mean you know if someone farts like that and you can still taste it through the mask like these Ugh. things can't be that effective no. there's no way like it does not feel i don't feel like it filters COVID, anything our, our, uh, it doesn't are fart particles smaller than covid which one is doug look i that don't up. think so i think <laughs> yeah. look up fart, fart particles fart particles larger yeah. what kind of mask would block a fart? i want to tap the shoulder of the guy in front of me like yeah bro you know i can still hey, freaking smell that oh, right like it was a big dude that was yes. him huh oh it was the big he dude. must have done four or five times on the plane i'm like Bro, oh, come bro. on! He was—it was a big dude. It definitely wasn't me. And he was—he had some sleep apnea because he kept choking while he would fall asleep. And oh, then, really? Yeah, dude. And his shirt was kind of up like this because he sat down, and then his like half his butt cheek was hanging out. So there was <laughs> nothing. He was there was fresh. There was no filter. Yeah. Oh man. There was air in your mask. That yeah, was it. That was stopping the whole. Yeah, stream. No, I could definitely taste it still. Yeah. Dude, that's all I'm thinking the whole time. I was like, "There's no way these things are that effective." <laughs> hey, dude. speaking the one time you really want it to work. You know? Yeah, this seems to be a conversation as well on the internet. Oh, oh really? Like questions like, if masks work, why can I still smell farts? <laughs> yeah. I see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A if a fart question. can make it through pants, how can a mask protect you? <laughs> these are questions. I mean, that well, was you see all these articles. Swear to God, that I'm sitting there on the plane as the, like the second one hits my face, and that's what's coming. To, I'm going like, you know what? This is fucking, it, dude. Again, medical professionals they have a whole protocol of how to put these N95s on, and it's like you're not supposed to be able to smell anything. You're not supposed to be able to, you know, have any kind of like. Um, Anything in there where you could actually like you can't touch you know, it. You know what my, you know what you my gotta theory wear it is? once. That's it. You know that's what my it. theory is? It's okay. So the, the those little shitty masks they go like this, and there's gaps all over here, and I, I think it actually creates like a vacuum. So like particles so that would be flying like this, and yeah. I'm like a straw in, because yeah, because there's these little holes, and you breathe. I think goes. So yeah. maybe maybe COVID <laughs> or a fart would have went like this and went past me, but because I have these little you, you gaps, you're, you're I pulling it, it goes in. Like this. Yeah, it goes and it right brings in. in. Mask. This is some science. That's here. a valid yeah. theory. No, yeah, no, right? No, no. So um, no, and even the masks themselves. If you if you look at this the the, the mesh in comparison to like particles of virus and stuff, it's like tiny. I know, bro. It's right. like a shopping cart if filling it with sand. Yeah. You know, it's like trying to fill your shopping cart with sand. It's gonna go all the way through. By the way, for every, everybody's like, if we're rattling people up here, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna piss you Who's off. Who's still more. mad about this? Like, it's, I, it's I'm gonna, over, guys. I'm gonna it's piss over. you off even more. So now I just read an article. There's data coming out comparing uh, places with strict mask mandates on children. So this is for kids now. So kids oh, two I saw and your up post versus places where there are no mask mandates for children. So and luckily. One of the beauties of, of this country is we have states, and states have a lot more control over your day-to-day -day life than the federal government does. So we can compare now, it's been a couple of years, we can compare states that acted one way versus states that acted another way, look at the data, do some controls, and say, did it work, did it not work? Here's what the data shows. Children wearing masks has no discernible had no discernible effect on infections or hospitalizations among children. Zero. So it was literally a waste of time. But beyond the waste of time, is there damage from having children wearing masks? And I will argue yes. And mm -hmm. I will argue this right now. And this is on a recorded podcast. So you could bring this up later on when it's proven to be true. They will show cognitive decline and challenges in children because part of your brain development, big part of your brain development for adults and children, especially children, is reading facial recognition, facial expression. Well, I mean, and, that's, and that's that is a lot going on there. And we just had kids for two years. It's a huge longer. part of communication that you're just cutting off uh, for nothing. I yeah. mean, that's not too Salstradamus because there's already that came out already. We know that the IQ points dramatically drop. Yeah, but they're trying to connect that to schooling at home and all that stuff. I think that plays a role too. I'm just I'm talking purely yeah, all about it plays a role. children not seeing facial expressions for six hours a day. I know, but that's I mean, how else are they going to measure that? 
I mean, they're going to have to measure it through things like that. There's, there, I think they're going to do, do more tests after later on. I know. But what, that's, what, what do you think that's going to look like? What, what's going to prove brain your, activation? What's going to prove your point more than that? Well, that their the IQ. I mean, oh, to me, that's I, yeah. that that's going to umbrella yeah, that statement more than anything else. Like, right. what's going to come out in five years from now that's going to prove your point yeah. more? That I just don't. The best one is already out, which yeah. we already see, which is crazy. The I fact that the it's already declining. I, and I like want that. people to take a look in the mirror right now because it's your fault that we did this to our kids, and it was driven by our own fear and paranoia. And mm -hmm. what we did is we took actions that were unreasonable. And we hurt our own kids over it. So next time an emergency happens, which will, there's always emergencies, remember ma the mass fear and hysteria that you allowed yourself to get manipulated over. And then one more, one more thing I'll add, we completely, even if, if the masks did work well, children do not use them in ways that would make them work. You're not, you can't expect a five-year-old oh, yeah. to treat a mask the way a surgeon does. They touch it, they're moving the fade, they're the same mask they wear for the whole week or it's however many months. Happen. To and you know what it is? This is a wonderful, the last two years is a wonderful, like, it's a beautiful examination of human psychology. Mm -hmm. Many of these policies were not passed because they actually help or work. Mm, it just makes you feel better. It's all about the yeah. false sense of safety. I feel safer now because, you know, kids are covering their faces, even I, though it doesn't I work. compare it to, to TSA, where we have all of these, like, um, limitations to get access through. You have to, like, put your bag in. You put your shoes in. Like, they're, like, they pat you down. You go through the x-ray. And then, meanwhile, somebody still just walked through the exit and got all of their, you know, they're oh, carrying, <laughs> yeah, like, guns and knives and what? all kinds of shit. Well, people, there. there's people who, like, test to show, like, oh, it doesn't work as well like, or whatever. Yeah. And the way that they'll get through is silly. And you just be like, why? You're just like, I can't believe they didn't stop them from going through the exit. I like, know. That's just well, like I still can't obvious... figure out how Doug got on with his big old gallon of water. Remember when we got, oh, through yeah. the, we got through the check and then he sat down and he opens his bed. He's like, oh shit, yeah. I walked right through with yeah. this. It was next to his machete. Both. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doug travels with feel so safe because like they're doing such a rigorous job of, yeah. of patting everybody down and then like they didn't consider the most obvious thing. I know. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. And it was Anyways. a whole big old, it, was, it wasn't water, it was vodka, by the way. It looked like water. You know, I, did you, you know, another one of your Good predictions uh, is starting to come true right now. Um, I'm sure you see it, of course, because you predicted it is. Uh, they're trying to come after Joe Rogan like crazy. Mm. You see the how much media is attacking him. And Bro. I saw one of the lamest memes ever about him yep. like from an well, old episode. So pay close attention because uh, data is coming out showing that Rogan has way more of an audience and influence than the next most popular eight media, you know, popular media, I guess, uh, channels and shows combined. So huge influence. Not and also combine that with the fact that Rogan seems to not really follow any particular narrative, and you know he'll speak his mind, and you'll have people that are counter narrative. Whether that's good or bad, that's not the point. The point is he has a lot of power, and he doesn't seem to be controlled or controllable. He is the new target. Pay attention. They're they're starting the, the campaign against them, and you're going to see articles. There was like this one thing where like 270 doc. I put here in quotation marks doctors because it, it turns out many of them were not doctors. Signed a thing saying that he should be kicked off Spotify. Then, uh, you know, people are posting 10 year old videos of him, you know, saying the wrong thing, which, by the way, you know, I, I love it when, you know, mass media tries to point out when someone else says something wrong. Like, <laughs> boy, I could show you last week how many things you guys said that was wrong. But they're all going after him now. He's he's enemy public enemy number so one. So imagine you're you're on the board of Spotify right now. Like, what do you think the mood or the climate is around that? Do you think they're like sitting around the well, board and they're excited or they're scared or they're like, oh, fuck, we got to do something? Like, what do you think that conversation would, looks like? It depends on what part of the company we're talking about. Yeah. Like, I mean, if the it's board, the employees, the, they're probably angry. No, 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 no. The, the board, the people yeah, the that are board, making, yeah. They're probably super pumped. But look at the numbers they're getting. I know. That's what it's I would insane. be. It's insane. It'd be like beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So you don't think there's any conversation going like, do we have to take action or we're worried about the government stepping in and actually well, I heard fucking with us like they probably fucked with Facebook and Twitter. Do we think that's going to happen I, to us now? Now all of a sudden we're going to get people crawling up our ass and all kinds of regulations the, if we don't do something. I heard it's like a, f a Finnish or a Swedish or a different uh, country like owns uh, Spotify and so they don't really Switzerland. care about uh, yeah, they're from, Switzerland. Yeah, that's, okay. it's a Switzerland based company. You don't really follow Swiss based company, right, Doug? I'm looking it up right now. Yeah. yeah. You know what the problem is? American politics Sweden. with it. Sweden. Sweden, oh, thank oh, you. Oh, they, they don't care. <laughs> you know what the you know what One the problem is? The problem is the way that Rogan communicates his information and the type of audience that he has. If they did shut him down, let's say Spotify kicked him off, 
you would only make him stronger. Yeah, you don't. You, you would only you if something happens to him or if they shut, he'll become a martyr. He'll become like way more popular and powerful. Uh, yeah, it's too before. late. He's too big now. He's too big, and the way and the, his type, the type of audience that he has. If you did that, you would only fuel the conspiracy theories. You would only fuel, you know, people saying, ah, they're trying to silence the truth. There, it's it's a it's a. If I was on the other end of this and I'm trying to shut him down. I'm looking at this going, wow, this is complicated. What are mm -hmm. we going to do? Because if we go at him this way, it's going to screw us. If we go at him this way, we're gonna, it's going to screw us. Like, what do we do? Speaking of which, there was a, I think it was a doctor recently on his show, and people are, 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 are putting this clip up as a gotcha. Like, oh, see, Rogan was wrong, right? So Rogan's talking to this doctor, <laughs> so and Rogan dumb. said something like, um, kids have a higher risk of myocarditis from the vaccine than they do from COVID. And this doctor said, I think it was a doctor who says, no, that's not true. Kids who get COVID have a slightly higher risk of myocarditis than if they got the vaccine. And then Rogan argued, and then they looked it up and the doctor was right. And so people are like, oh, here's your gotcha moment. The risk of myocarditis from COVID is higher than that of the vaccine. The problem with that is this is a classic example of data manipulation. Okay. So I'm going to explain. Not that. only that, but what a stupid thing to like debate and argue. It, well, it, and here's where the data manipulation comes into play. Number one, we all know that children get far less severe side effects or, or effects, I should say, from COVID, oftentimes get no real effects or maybe the sniffles. So a large percentage, it's easily, we can easily assume that a large percentage of kids who get COVID don't even get tested or don't get brought to the hospital, right? It's the ones that get tested are the ones with really bad symptoms or the ones that get hospitalized. So what you're comparing is severe COVID to the vaccine. You're also assuming all kids will get COVID. Okay, so really, if you really want to look at the comparison, you have to compare all children, all categories, COVID, no COVID, mild COVID, severe COVID, to kids who get a vaccine. And then if you do that, then you do see the risk of myocarditis is higher in the vaccine than it is in, in that category. So that's data manipulation right there for you folks. And they, they, so they, he was they still, do use that. So he was still right then. He was, but he didn't, know, he didn't communicate that, right? He kind of dropped it there and it looked like he got... You know, whatever. Speaking of data, I have something for you guys. Okay, remember when we talked about this, the pandemic and like what happened with Amazon and the, the death of kind of like brick and mortar oh, yeah. and like e-commerce and where mm -hmm. that's going? What is your guy? First of all, uh, one, where do you think the state of brick and mortar is right now? And then two, what is your prediction hmm. going forward on what that's going to look like? Do you think that this pandemic just accelerated what was already the inevitable that was already happening us? moving to digitally and all online do you think there is a future in brick and mortar if it is what does it look like what, what's your guys' theories on all that boy that's a good question yeah it's interesting because it, it seems to be shifting a little bit but i'm not sure if that's like in all industries like i i would say that um the the forced lockdowns um took the market share it, away from small businesses and gave it to the big businesses that could that yeah. continue to operate for sure so amazon walmart target <clears throat> got a larger percentage of the market share because small brick and mortars were forced to shut down. And these larger ones had- I uh, mean, that, yeah, that's not much of a prediction. Though. Right, like, so I think small, I think brick and mortars got hurt. The larger companies got larger market shares, which, you know, income inequality or whatever you want to call it just grew as a result of these policies. I think the pendulum will swing back a little bit. I don't think it'll ever go back to where it was before. And then as far as the future is concerned, this is just my guess, yeah. that the small brick and mortar businesses are going to change- in the sense that they might be more like showrooms yeah. versus, you know, stocking all their product and selling it. So I trip, remember thinking trip that on same. this. Q4 numbers just came in, right, from, from last year yeah. for brick and mortar. Up 14% higher than pre-pandemic all-time highs. Wow. Dude, what? Wow. 14% higher. Now, is this a is this are these across small the board, or? all spaces? Your point. Yes, this happened during the pandemic. There was a, and I had, the, I don't know the exact percentages off, but it was like, I want to say, say it was seven to 10 percentage points mm -hmm. uh, moved from obviously brick and mortar to, you know, uh, e commerce. Yeah. Uh, and then that shifted back for the most part. But brick and mortar is still consistently growing. And it was 14% higher in Q4 than the highest all time high pre pandemic. Now, is this, okay, so I, is Tri this. Is that trippy or what? Is this I would have never guessed scratch that. my head on that. Yeah, one. now, is it so, okay, because I want to look at the data because does this mean, for example, with the gym industry, a lot of gyms shut down, but the ones that remained now have a larger percentage of the yes. market share? So, the, what, what, what happened is. 
consumers uh, have not changed as much as you think they've, or we thought right. they have changed. Consumers have stayed consistent and the same with the way they purchased and stuff like that. The only thing that really happened was the pandemic killed a lot of small mom and pop businesses that were potentially struggling already and kind of weeded them out and the strong mm -hmm. resilient businesses that stuck had around stuck around mm -hmm. and now they are just reaping the benefits that of makes that. sense because the, mm. the one if you could survive the pandemic you were more efficient that's right you yeah. produce better services better products and you're better positioned to serve the market and so what it did is it got rid of the competition which was already on the borderline and allowed these other businesses that do a better job to flourish. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Oh, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Wild yeah. though, huh? That is, is very interesting. Yeah, I would have I would have not thought that at all, man. I wow, did not that see, is I did not see that coming. Really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. It is interesting to see kind of what's That's going encouraging. on. Encouraging. Mm -hmm. Real estate's weird. Like, uh, so we were just in uh, in Utah over the weekend, um, and we're looking at we're setting up a property over there because we plan on putting together, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, putting together these locations that people could go to that are where there's lots of stuff you could do around it. So we went to, this is near park city. So the skiing, there's summer, uh, you know, stuff you could do. There's a lake there mm -hmm. and we wanted a place where you could go and we were going to set it up with red light and PRX equipment and, you know, just make it like a place where you could like optimize your health and fitness and then do all these fun activities, which is really cool. Um, I mean, the gym's going to be sick. The way we talked about setting up all the PRX and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's going to be really, really cool. Um, but when we were talking to our agent out there, it, she was telling us how much the prices have gone up in that area in like the last five years. Yeah. Tripled. Crazy. So I just, wa I just, well, I haven't finished it, but I'm watching the, the most recent uh, Peter Linneman update. So we've had Peter Linneman on the show. Um, he, I found him a long time ago on the Walker webcast. And he comes on at least once a year on there. Um, something I think he did twice last year, but they were revisiting his predictions uh, last year, and he literally drilled everything, everything from GDP to interest rates he was right. to yeah, everything. Like he hit everything. Probably of all the economists that I listen to, which I listen to a lot on and uh, some competing and disagreeing and stuff like that. Like he's been the most accurate on everything. And he's extremely bullish on this year on real estate, on consumer, on everything like mm. ever that we are about to see. He's he's saying like a two to four percent or a two to four percent more growth in GDP than what pre pandemic mm. growth was looking like. And his theory on that is just the makeup of what we lost during the the pandemic time. Right. And part of what is uh, that's accompanied by is the amount of of money in people's checkings account right now. Yes, I read that. That's right. It There's a lot of savings. It averages yeah. around, so the the long-running stat for you know decades has been roughly $2 trillion, give or take, is what is typically in people's accounts. And right now we're sitting like at $8.7 trillion. Now, so you're is, talking about six, more than three times the amount of money that's sitting there. Now, is did he talk about if that's like, relatively if the distribution of that stayed the same or if that's wealthy people with way oh, more well he's now? talked about in the past that w one of the, the the worst parts of all the things we've talked about that we've been scared about w from covid the one of the worst things was the the wealth gap that we all talk that we it we, just grew yeah. yeah it we we saw we saw the largest wealth gap in history happen like right before our eyes and not a lot of people talked about it yeah i mean we were talking about deaths we we're talking about interest rates we're talking so about because of that let's say there's a huge so let's speculate a little bit maybe you know this adam um huge increase in savings right liquid cash or mm -hmm, money mm -hmm. And uh, your space, essentially what we're saying is that m a greater percentage of that was to the wealthy, it not distributed like it was before. I so, say. okay, there, I think we should clarify on what you mean by that. So it isn't that the money got distributed more to the wealthy. It's, it's that the that, wealthy grew faster. It's, yes, it's that because you pumped so much money into the economy, money will essentially go chase mm -hmm. goods and assets. And we're actually just becoming smarter over time. 40 years ago, when something like this would happen, a lot of that money would chase consumer goods. We're yeah. actually becoming smarter and we realize that, oh my God, all this money getting pumped in, inflation's sure to happen, should grab a hold of assets. So it's chasing assets. That's why that's why real estate's exploded. Right. And there and so you have people who have already lots of assets, multiple properties, or own a lot of stock. 
um, they just got much wealthier during this time and the people that do not have any of those things. So even though the people who probably were you know, under the poverty line or lost jobs or were struggling financially, they actually got the checks. The money initially yeah. went to them. This is, a, this is what I always try to explain to people that are, are pro all this stuff that, that want the, the handouts and the help. It's like the money still all, it always ends up back to them. So yeah. why they, all the politicians the sit up the there assets. and say, we're going to help you out and free pizza and here's more of this and oh, pushing UBI and stuff like that. It doesn't, all you do, you give that to somebody who's barely getting by financially. You give them a few hundred or even say a few thousand, you know, a month more. And eventually what ends up happening is it gets put right back into the yeah. system and the people that are holding the companies, holding the assets, and it still ends up back in their pocket. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to see, and the reason why I pointed that out is because all that growth, we're probably going to see it. a lot of it be concentrated in those things, assets. That's his prediction. So his prediction, especially when you when you factor in that a lot of money went to banks and a lot of money went to people in their checking and savings. So you have a lot of liquid, like you said, and then banks got a ton of money. So they have a ton of lending power right now. And then you have this Fed coming out saying that we're going to move up. So the, the prediction is five to six basis points over two years. Yeah. The likelihood of what that will look like is about a quarter basis point uh, per quarter. So mm -hmm. you'll see like 0.25 go up on the interest rate. Then the next quarter, 0.25 again. Yeah. So in two years, we'll go up like two, two percentage points. What that will do is we'll drive people will be urgent. Oh my God, it's going to go up in a year or two. Got to go buy. Mm -hmm. Banks are loaning money. I've got money put away a little bit because of this money that I've saved during the pandemic. And it's only going to, and then real estate is still millions this underbuilt. Is, yeah. And this is also why I just read an article on the increase of, uh, uh, of the price of new cars. It went up like 15%. Mm. But, but if you look at luxury cars, Luxury cars went up the most. Of all new cars, the cars that are like 50,000 or more or 60,000 or more went hmm. up the most because you had all these people with more money, with yeah. lots of money. Yeah. That's what they want to buy. They want to buy the luxury cars. And then used cars went up a lot as well, but that's mainly because the supply was so short. Yeah, so then, people yeah. didn't want to wait to get their car a year later with that, so yeah. then it drove up the demand wow, for that. But that. yeah, we just... We're so behind on building that even if we, if if every all the projects that are started come come true, you have the largest generation coming in to buy homes. You've got the most liquid we ever seen. We have historically low interest rates. You have the, the most low about, too. It ain't. Yeah. They can't catch. Do we ever catch up on a lot of those material building materials? I know that went through the roof for a while. So that's Literally. that was that's part of the what what Nails caused the everything. being so behind. Like we yeah. ever since the crash and uh, the the big 08 crash or whatever like that with the housing market and stuff or was it 07 whatever yeah, the uh, year was so when, when, when that happened we started to try and keep that from happening again we've continually underbuilt mm -hmm. that's that's a big portion of why real estate has continued to crush since 09 and it's just low ran around yeah supply. because we, we we intentionally kept it down because mm -hmm. what we were afraid of was to put ourselves in another predicament like that so we've been underbuilding forever and then not forever but since 09 and then on top of that then you come into the issues with there you were know no buildings materials yeah. going up and so and then pandemic everybody yep. slowing down not building so that just put us on on the back Everything burner stalled so, yeah. yes so and that's part of his theory on why we're going to be so bullish for the next two years is because it, it, um, even if you believe a correction is coming it's we got to catch up first before that yeah. correction happens I feel, I feel like there's still more air to be pumped into there is yeah what's yeah it, it's, it's coming for sure Woo! it's gonna be a good time i can't wait to see what the fed does when their rise in interest rates doesn't do anything to the inflation because that's what i think that's too little too late we're gonna see inflation continue to grow they're moving it up a quarter or whatever. Like, are they going to crank it up even more? Or what's yeah. going to happen? So what I, what I, the one thing I don't, I don't understand this. I haven't been able to wrap my brain around. Um, so part of why they can't do that is because then they can't service their own debt. <laughs> we have so much. So debt. they're in this weird predicament of, yeah, we need to raise interest rates so we could slow down mm -hmm. the inflation rate, but then we can't raise them so fast that we can't service our own debt. So Which, by the, the way, we, they're, we, they're this we, damned if you do, damned I if you know. don't type of situation. Maybe we should print our own money. Uh oh, just kidding. <laughs> don't, don't assassinate me. Don't do that. <laughs> Doug, if you can look up how long it would take to count to a million, a billion, and a trillion at once, if you count one every second, because I want people to get an idea of, of what a trillion The difference is. between a million and a billion and the difference between a billion and a trillion. Well, you did this not that long ago on the I show. did a million and a billion, but I want to do it no, again. No, you did a trillion. And did you we? did it. Yeah, you did it based off of time and you were showing- Yeah, like one, if every second, if you had to count every second, yeah. how long would it take to get to a trillion? Which is the number is yeah, the same. Yeah, did he do this, Andrew? Mm -hmm. Did he? Did you put a, a thing up on the- Yeah, you did, I remember when you- it's, It blew my mind because I've never seen anybody do that before and- 
I would have never thought the difference between a billion and a trillion was that oh, dramatic. It's insane. And what that, is, what a great way to, to highlight What does that. it say there, Doug? Yeah, 11 days, 13 hours, 46 minutes, is a, 40 is a, seconds to a million. That's a million. A okay. million. So just say round. 11 days is a million. 11 days is a million. So you know, everyone okay. is trying to remember all the math. So 11 yeah. days is a million. All right. And for a billion, we it's got- It's like 31 years, right? Uh, so yeah, so under in days, so eleven thousand five hundred seventy-four days. I don't know how many years that is. <laughs> well, that doesn't help us. Eleven. Well, that well, three yeah, goes into so, that. So like twelve to fifteen years. Why? Well, see, I typed in this in wrong. So let me just say, uh, how many? Yeah. Uh, how many? Uh, one how many billion days? seconds in years, or something like that, or how many days? Yeah, I guess. So you get eleven days for the the million. Okay, and to count to a billion, it's thirty is, years. 30 years. So 30 years. Okay, so, it goes, so, so it goes 11, 11 days, <laughs> then it goes to 30 years, which is a huge gap. Now That's go to massive. a trillion. A trillion is a number that you wouldn't even guess. I know. I, I, I remember when I day. saw it, I blew my mind. Yeah, 31,709 years. 31,000. That's crazy. Yeah, and years. How, and how many? How many goes from days, 11 days, to 30 years, which is a huge jump, and then it goes to 31,000 yeah. so years. Now, keep in mind, we're, we're, we're printing trillions of dollars- uh, right now, like crazy, and it's not tied to any goods or services. So that's why every, everybody, everybody who wants to that wants to think that, that there's much? this crazy. They don't. It's all electronic. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah it, they're not printing. You know, it you would imagine like it would cost you millions of dollars to print trillions. Of yeah, dollars. Here's, that that money has to go somewhere and it has to chase something. Yeah, and historically, it's it's consumer goods and mm -hmm. assets. And historically, in the way past, it was m more consumer goods. We're smarter now, yeah. just in general, because of the information that's available to us now that people are like, oh, shit. That's true. Which is why we see these these kind of silly assets uh, like NFTs, cryptocurrencies. I mean, people are Baseball just- cards. Yeah, we're, they're chasing anything. They're taking anything that they think is of value right now and putting it there. And that's where yeah. a, why you know, it's, all these books, markets are exploding. Comic books, baseball yeah. cards, football, all record highs. Oh, did you see the? Did you yeah. guys see the little thing that's going viral right now with what's his face, the Logan Paul with the he got ripped, uh, scammed he off got of three point five Pokemon cards. Yeah, but they're saying that that was kind of a way to for him to pump up his NFT thing. Oh my god! Oh my god, oh my god. bro! GI Joe, GI Joe. So yeah, so I've seen different predictions on that, right? So I I heard that he's doing that just to, to exactly because he's a big pusher of NFTs yeah. and so the idea is that he's but then I saw another thing showing that a buddy of his was the one that actually sold it to him. And he was the one and they actually had somebody come over and authenticate it. The company that that's what they specialize in authenticating it who authenticated it. So 3 million though. He was he paid 3 million for Pokémon. So where's the So scam? trip on this though. I did hear somebody break down what that means to him which is it's crazy. Well, you, here's a perfect cuz you're comparing things like this. So he's worth 100 million dollars. Yeah. So he's his net worth is 100 million. So do the do that. So that's literally like It's like you have 100 grand, you lost 3 grand. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really not that, not big that of a deal. it isn't that big of a deal. But I mean, you see that on on YouTube, like holy shit, dude lost three point five million. Three million, million on, to me is a lot. Yeah, on a Pokemon cards, like how crazy that is. Yeah. Ironically, the YouTube views that he'll get off of that will probably it'll, negate. He'll recover, yeah, we'll recover a quarter of that instantly <laughs> just from the that views. Video probably made him three million dollars. Yeah, you know, funny, right? Yeah. Hey, speaking, let's go let's go back to when we were in Utah. Let's talk about the snowmobiling. I'd never done that. You guys had done that before. Yeah. Very, I was very proud of you. I know. Proud so of me? You got Sal yeah, out for in nature. It. That's like impossible. So I dude. originally. So it's cold. I don't like the cold. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not a big snow person. Not, right. I don't like it. Now, yeah. and riding this big machine. Dude, by the way, did I not call it? Did I not call that they would try to take us on shit? That when I qualified to ride, I'm gonna call you out right now. I knew it. I'm like, oh, they're gonna. This is a little bit of a flex. They're gonna yeah. make us do some shit that we're not. It's my first time ever being on one. And yeah. of all I, of us, right? We all bailed a few yeah. times, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. it was it was a good time. Yeah. Well, Doug and I have ridden before. My only experience riding though was like with a with a guided experience, which was cool about here. You gotta love Utah for this. Like we roll up to this place. And uh, not only get snowmobiles, we get like the highest power ones. Yeah. I mean, these are 850s. like eight fifties. These things move, right? And mm, they're fun. And all we had to do was sign a quick waiver, rent our shit, and then we were like hook it up to our own trailer yep. and take off. I know. And then you head out to this this place that's got two million acres. It of was cool watching. I don't remember his name. It was uh, it was 
Um, Kyle's freaking, friend? Yeah, yeah, it was Kyle's friend. And he was a pro. Yeah. yeah. Watching him maneuver and manipulate. Oh, just that. cutting up into the mountain, like on like one ski and the other one's hanging off. Oh, and standing on the side and, you know, using one hand. I was like, wow, that is incredible. Yeah, so I've, cool I've, stuff. I've driven a lot of like ATVs, dirt bikes, uh, ski doos. I mean, you name it. I've like driven all those things. Mm -hmm. For sure, snowmobiling is the hardest to, to is it really? control. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, you're on a single track on the back. Your two front steering wheels are you know, yeah. sleds that are on ice. So, you know, or on snow. So if it's a compacted at all, you don't get any grip or traction. No. There's nothing else no. like you it. You like, can't turn it like a U-turn is like impossible. No. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's more difficult to maneuver than any of those so, other ones. So who won between the race with you guys? I watched the video. It's hard to tell who won. Justin I mean, got me on one. Yeah. yeah I got, I got on one. Him. Yeah. 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 Got me on another one. Yeah. There was one. got Kyle. The, like, the, I smoked Kyle. Yeah. He yeah, did. He did not like that. Which was surprising. He ate my dust. He took the wrong side i think it was like two but it was like this you know what's it's um what's the word i want to use it's uh it's it, it seems more challenging when you look at it like a, a hill it's like 45 degrees like i can't go up that thing but no you hit the gas and you'll make it up there yeah. just don't lose your balance like yeah. i did a i mean we, everybody crashed right dude, yeah. justin went over the handlebars <laughs> yeah. dude he so crashed I, a couple times right you crashed in the powder then you crashed again on yeah, the little goalie the, but he crashed hard well yeah, i didn't the time. other one was yeah i just kind of barely kind of stepped off of it but this one was was brutal. I was going down the hill and like didn't realize there was like a shelf there, a little cliff, and didn't see like the other side of it and it, how far down it was. And I just launched right over it and I was going fast. And so I, I hit and kind of stuck and then I boom flipped right over it. <laughs> yeah. I know because so, after I didn't see him fall and then I see Justin right up and he's doing the QL stretch, you know. Doing I'm this like, thing, uh, I'm like, oh shit, what happened, bro? Yeah, <laughs> like I dude. fell off. I went hard. Yeah, I went over the front so, of the head. Of so since we're since we're talking about Utah, I do want to share a little bit more about the the vision for this these properties that yeah, we want to do yeah. because this is a big, we, this is a, exciting for us. It's totally new, but exciting. I, I'm I'm yeah. really excited about this. I have I have no idea what to expect and anticipate. Um, the goal is to be able to do it through the audience and not have to go through like Airbnb and VRBO to make it more. Uh, inclusive, make it more our like a yeah. service that we're kind of providing for our audience. And then also it's an investment for us. So we're obviously trying to make money off of this too. And the idea is that I, I've, and I've, I've never seen these before. So if somebody has ever seen an example of this, please send to me so I can do my own homework and research on how other people manage this. But this idea of this unplug biohacking type of house, we have all these great connections and relationships, right? So this house, we went and spec'd it all out, right? So this is a 2,500 square foot townhouse with four bedrooms. Um, it's going to have a steam room, a sauna, a jacuzzi, sick ass garage, ju gym. juve infra infrared, cold plunge. the PRX, a cold plunge and a movie theater. Yeah. All in this place. Yeah. And then we'll do other things as far as the plasma TVs. And then, and we then you're obviously in a location where you can ski, snowboard. You can, In the summer, there's a lake. You can kayak. You can mountain yeah. bike. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. now, obviously, this is going to cost, to obviously, to run a jacuzzi and cold plunge and uh, saunas and things like that. It, you know, I, we know that it's going to run the bill up. We're also in kind of uh, higher end places. So it will be a premium luxury type of place. So I know it's not going to attract the same kind of traffic that like your standard just place is going yeah. to be. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe that there's a demand for something like this. And I, I can't be the only, I know you guys can't, we can't be the only people that would love. I would do it. Right. Yeah. Love yeah, if I was looking for places to rent and I wanted to go to a place like that, where I was going to either ski or snowboard or do mountain bike and all that stuff. And I'm comparing and I saw a place with like a gym in the garage and you know, red light therapy, and I could do the steam and the sauna, and then maybe there's like Cold supplements plunge, in there. Cause we're going to work with all our partners, so this house will be decked out. Mm -hmm. I would 100%. I'd be so excited. I'd be like, that's where I'm going to go yeah. and stay. You so know? I, the, one of the things I like, and I love our forum to start maybe a poll. Maybe Helen will do this when she hears this episode. On uh, this is the first one, so this is the test, right? So we went there, we specced it all out, like every we did all like high end stuff inside. So it's going to be a beautiful place, right outside of Park we City. We mostly agreed on the decor. On the, on like the <laughs> yeah, we had I was surprised by that. I actually told Brooke beforehand. Yeah. I'm like, you know. I really don't know about how to Brooke, four. by the way. She really, she, she really she did uh, a great job. She, yeah, she's a, she's a very, very good agent. Yeah, uh, she no, she's been, job. she's been phenomenal. Yeah, if you're ever looking for an agent in Utah, look her up for sure. She's attached to my Instagram. You've probably seen her before. Um, but I, I warned her, like, I don't know what this is going to be like. 
all four of us have different style and taste. Like this is going to be. We, we mostly agreed. We did. Yeah. I thought we all. I think the we only were, I mean, thing there's that, a lot of push pull, but it ended up like, oh yeah, like yeah. I see where you're going with yeah. that, and I liked it. Yeah. The like, only okay. thing that we we disagreed on a couple things. One of them was the backsplash in the kitchen. I was real set on more of a rustic <laughs> look. You guys yeah. wanted the shinier. Yeah, that top. and then the marble countertop that went down. Like, yeah. Adam was kind of bummed we didn't do yeah. that. But uh, yeah, no, go. but otherwise we mostly got along, and and I think it's going to look. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's going to look amazing. Um, and I'm super excited excited to see how it does but what i'd love to hear from the the audience especially if you're in our private forum because i'll ask if helen does like a poll for this is i would really be interested in what the audience would what what destinations would you like right so if park mm -hmm. city utah mm -hmm. is the first one near one of the best ski resorts in the country what are other places in the united states i don't want to, we're not going to go uh, outside there first in the united states where, i would i would think a, like a beach or tropical location would well, yeah, be that's, I, that's i know what we yeah, i know what or we like all a think sedona or something like that too yeah. i would else? like to see what the, i would love to see a poll and then to see what gets the most likes and traction mm -hmm. because i know we have our theories and ideas on yeah. what the second one the third one would look like but I'd be really interested in the, the places that our audience yeah. would love to go the most. And then that might decide, yeah. might dictate what direction we go. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I like to see right now is I like to see that your guys' faces aren't so damn dry. Oh, like they were over bro. there. Oh, I, I feel like my whole face is going to crack. Yeah. But all you guys are so. I, hey, can't, I, mean, Cal, I, got, hey, I got oily Caldera asses. saved my life for sure on my face. I, I actually all got, last night just splashed everything. So I. <laughs> just it was so. It just absorbed it immediately. So I, the whole time. I actually contemplated putting. So my <laughs> lips are. Are so fucking cracked. My lips are split oh, and are so dry, it. and they hurt. What you guys were doing all night? I was. <laughs> just, <laughs> I was my literally. I, I was contemplating putting the serum on my lips because it, it fun, was dude. helping my skin, but it, my my lips were still all dried out. So my face felt fine. Lips are all cracked and dry. And I'm like, I wonder if I would rub the stuff all over my lips if I would have been all right. But it, you know what I, mean? I know that's why I didn't want to do it because I, I took like well. the regular lotion that was there. I was like putting it in my nose because my nose was cracking and bleeding on the inside. It hurt. And I'm just like, I just got to yeah. throw like moisture stuff in here. Yeah. You sound like every time you took a breath, it sounded like Zamfir with your nose. <laughs> yeah. I like Triscuits in there. Well, I'm yeah. super pumped about, so this, the, where we were, we're buying back to that house. What's so cool about this too, is that, so we're, we're like phase seven and every time they, they move up a phase of obviously the prices go up <laughs> and they add amenities and so we're the last phase of this and they have the soft water included in it they have the humidifier, humidifier ran through the entire the house thing. which yeah. so the new models in the are gonna, theater yeah but in the theater room is going to be uh I'm, I'm most excited about that yeah. i mean that's my one thing i miss in the the trucky location is that we don't have like a really cool movie place which i know we did that intentionally but there's times when I'm up there and I'm like, damn, I wish we had a cool place to yeah. watch a movie. Yeah, know? that's I, I like mm -hmm. that too. But it's nice to not have it. It gives you the excuse to hang out together. You know? Yeah, I mean? yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is you know. Thing. But yeah, I know you guys coming out of your rooms in the morning. It was like. Justin looked like he had toasted some bread and just rubbed the crumbs all over <laughs> yeah. his face. Like, still look like What's that? up, dude? What well, we probably would have been bro. fine, except for we all opened our windows. That's what it was. We all yeah. opened our windows because, well, we made the mistake, and then we also ran the fireplace. Like, the fireplace dries it out even more, mm -hmm. so running the fireplace all day, having the windows open, like, I mean, we just, it was like that's like a recipe it's for perfect like the, storm, dude. Yeah, that was pretty dumb on our part. Hey, real quick, uh, let me tell you about one of our sponsors, LMNT. Now, they make electrolyte powders with no artificial sweeteners that have the appropriate level of sodium to improve performance, give you better pumps, better recovery. They taste really, really good. I love them. I notice a, a difference in the pumps that I get when I work out. This is especially important for those of you that don't eat a lot of processed foods. You know, uh, We actually, especially if you work out a lot, probably don't get as much sodium as you need. I know that's contrary to popular belief, but it's actually quite true. By putting LMNT in your water, it tastes good. You get the magnesium, the pot potassium, and especially the appropriate levels of sodium that you need for best performance. The best part is you can try them out, get a sample pack, and pay almost nothing. So if you're interested, head over to mindpumppartners.com, click on uh, LMNT, and get their offer. It's a free LMNT sample pack. Go check them out. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Dopetastic Dieter. If I'm in a caloric deficit to lose body fat, should my calories be the same for training and non-training days? Oh, yeah. I this, get asked this question all the time. Yeah, this is an interesting question, and there, I, don't think, uh, I don't think there's a, a wrong or a, a right answer for this. I think yeah. it's kind of a personal uh, um, preference. I actually like to play with this. Uh, some some people would say staying consistent is is easier and better, but I actually 
find this is one of the easier ways for me to manipulate my calories mm -hmm. instead of doing it like every other day or schedule. It's just like my workout days. I'm fed more on my off days. I cut back a little bit. I did the same thing yeah. and I found more energy and better workouts. And yeah. I would argue better recovery from feeding myself more on the days where I'm uh, placing a higher demand on my body, right? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm training my body and breaking things down, causing some damage. It makes logical sense to feed your body more on those days and then to have less calories on the days off in between. Now, the argument is, well, on the days off in between, you need to recover as well. Perhaps it is all a wash, but I did notice better workouts and I did play with this quite a bit. So in essence, instead of being at, let's say, a 500 calorie deficit every single day, you'd be on a thousand calorie deficit on the days you don't work out and no calorie deficit on the days you do work out. So at the end of the week, it equals out to the same thing, but you're more fed on the training days. I think it does require a bit more mental discipline for mm -hmm. some people. Like, so if I'm able to, you know, bring my calories up substantially to, to not have the tendency to want to keep them up when I'm not as active, like that takes a little bit more, um, you know, th discipline and, and uh, safeguards in place. Uh, or if you, if you can actually do that, I find that for me personally too, and a lot of my clients, they had a lot more, um, success with that because it did fuel their workouts better and they had, you know, better recovery and, and undulating like that, you know, still provided really good results. Yeah, well, now, there's, there's, there's research to support that undulating is superior than is. getting straight. So that yeah. we're clear on what we don't have anything to support is whether that matters if it's on a training day or a rest day. Yeah. So that's why I would say that's a personal preference. You know, maybe you're somebody who likes to have a, a lighter stomach on training days and when you're recovering, you prefer to well, load it up. Well, let's talk to the behavior aspect, right? For some people, and I had clients like this, it was easier for them to eat less on the days they worked out. That's what why? I'm saying. Because they're already in the mental state of I'm they're, training and I'm getting fit. And they're busy. Mm -hmm. And they're you're busy. busy. You're busy, you're moving. Yes, you're moving versus where I'm at home and I'm not busy. Around. Yeah, and I want to enjoy my food. I want to go out with my friends and eat more. In, in which case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this right now and I'll always say this. Unless it's like a coping mechanism. Yeah. I'll say this all day long. Behavior comes first, right. right? So if it allows you to stay more consistent overall, then go with eating less on the days you work out. If that's you, right? And I get, like, again, I had clients like that where they're like, look, on Saturdays and Sundays, I don't train. I want to go out and eat more. Um, when I'm training, I'm more occupied. I'm less thinking about food. I'm not going out to eat as much. So I'd rather eat less on those days. And I would tell them, fine, do it that way. Because at the end of the day, it's the behavior part that's the most important. But for me personally, if when I would break things down to performance, if I if I get even to, to get even more specific, it was the meal I had two hours before I worked out. So if I worked out first thing in the morning, I would make sure the dinner the night before was much larger. And that's where I would make up the difference in my calories. So if mm -hmm. you want to get real specific, and we're splitting hairs here, but if you want to get real specific, studies do show having a higher calorie meal with carbohydrates and proteins about two hours before athletic performance shows improved performance, more, more stamina, more endurance, and more strength. Um, but other than that, if, if one works better for you than the other, and it's more likely to keep you consistent, that's what you should focus on. Not the splitting of hairs where you know I'm going to recover 3% faster or I'm going to notice a 5% increase in yeah. performance. That's not nearly as important, especially on a long-term basis. Next question is from Carnivore Girl 84 What are the pros and cons of wearing gloves when lifting? I'm a musician, and it's important for me to maintain flexibility in my hands and fingers. Yeah, so let's start with the obvious, right? Do you, you guys remember the... Um the meme that was that went viral, like, I don't know, like probably four or five years ago. And it, it was like a glove, but it looked like underwear. Oh, uh, so it looked like a, don't you guys remember that one? No. Pull that up, Doug, uh, look up uh glove meme underwear. And okay. you guys will see, I know you had to seen this. Glove. No, I don't know. What, what, what uh, did yeah, the meme say? I, it didn't, I don't think it said anything. It was just, a, or I think it said something like what you look like wearing gloves at the gym. Uh, 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 you know what I'm saying? And it okay. looks like underwear. Like, so you'll well, see Mark the, Wahlberg pulls it off. So well, he wears like gardening gloves. I mean, the white receiver <laughs> gloves or whatever, you yeah. know? Okay. So let's talk about the obvious. You wear gloves. You're less likely to get calluses. Your skin is going to stay softer. So some people think, you know, that's important for them. So that's the obvious. But let's talk about the not so obvious. So I, as a kid, used to be a glove wearer when I worked out. And I wore, oh, there it is, hander pants. <laughs> That's great. It does look like that. That's hilarious. Hander so pants. So when I was a kid, I wore the gloves that were the mesh, 
like top yeah. and the fingers cut and off. The fingers cut off. And yeah. that was because of Rocky. I'm going to be honest, right? I watched Rocky. <laughs> I think we all went through a phase of that. Yeah. Well, they were they were popular back they then. They were. Yeah, and yeah. you know, Rocky, you know, he's in the first one and he's and body, bil- Bodybuilders were rocking them back then, yeah. too. Yeah. Until and, you realize how bad they stink. Yeah. And you're like, get rid of them. But here's the thing I, I hate wearing gloves now because the, the I'm more connected to the bar and to the weights when I don't have gloves on because there's a lot of nerve endings in your hands and you oh, want to yeah. feel what's going on. And I feel like I can. I have better technique and form and connection Mm -hmm. to the weight with my hands uh, without gloves than when I have gloves on. Here's something else that's less, uh, that's not discussed often. When you wear gloves, you actually increase the circumference of the bar when you grip. So that may mean that it's harder for you to hold on to a bar. So it would be, it's, it's similar to grabbing a thicker barbell, right? So if you grab a thicker barbell, it's harder to hold on to a heavy weight when your hand is like this versus when your hand is closed. Oh, I would challenge that though. I would challenge that because I would say the the difference of that circumference uh, making it more difficult is negated by the, the little bit better grip because you're using leather. I think you get just as good of a grip. I, not I don't. Better. I don't think. I don't, no. I no. Well, okay. Uh, let's compare it with chalk. Sorry, I always use chalk. So chalk versus gloves, oh, I get okay. just as well, good yeah. a grip. Yeah. Okay. That's well, yeah. Well, chalk's no, I'm, the move. I'm I mean, talking about barehanded. Barehanded versus yeah, gloves with sweat. I get it. You get you get a better grip with gloves for sure. But it you know. So I think what you're saying is kind of negated by that. It's not. I think that's splitting hairs. The difference yeah. on it. it. But I'm curious what you guys think on her. So she specifically is a musician, and she's concerned about flexibility in her hands and fingers. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it makes a difference with flexibility. Yeah. I could see it affecting your skin. I mean, I definitely have calluses from Right, that's what the only thing I would I would maybe consider wearing gloves if your fingertips and and, st- and your fingers get calluses well, on it and that affects flexibility without the gloves, I would think. You would yeah. what? You'd have more flexibility without the gloves. Also, you have more range of motion, more connectivity. Yeah, yeah. but I, again, I think that's also splitting hairs too. I think also, you're not going to lose much by wearing gloves either. I'll ask you this okay. this question, Justin, because you're the you're the musician of the group. Um, depending on the instrument that you that you play, uh, don't, aren't cal- aren't don't you develop calluses from playing like the sure. guitar? Oh, big time. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I, th- I think it might be a detriment. And it's to advantageous having- too, right? Because otherwise, like, it, there's always like a, a period you go through where um, you're, you're playing for a while and then it just like, it digs into your skin. And like, sometimes I've, I've gotten to the point too, where I've even cut, um, you know, the tips of my fingers and then it would set me back, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for a while. Um, but yeah, like it, just like anything else, I think um, you know your skin adapts uh, to to what stimulates you. Ever you're seen like a, a violinist's neck? You ever seen that? They get like this thick patch of oh, cause skin because they're because they're you know constantly the whole... like pinching that. Yeah, yeah, dude. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they get. I don't. They actually actually a name for it. So I mean, I guess if if the calluses that you get from weightlifting affect your playing whatever instrument you're negatively. playing, negatively, then yeah, negatively, then you absolutely should wear gloves. And I think that's a smart strategy. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't affect you playing your instrument, then yeah. I think it's more beneficial to not wear gloves. Yeah. Now, right? I, I, or, I'm going I'm to argue this, right. like uh, chalk, if your gym doesn't allow chalk, uh, join another gym. Just kidding. If you can't use chalk in your gym, they have liquid chalk, which you can use. I feel way more connected to the weight when my skin is touching the barbell and the mm-hmm. dumbbells versus wearing gloves. I've tried gloves recently and I just don't feel as in control of the weight and, and the muscles I'm trying to isolate or feel than when I'm fully connected. And I think it's similar for like any gear that you wear. Now, sometimes gear is necessary. Um, like you can't go barefoot if you have weak, if you have poor ankle mobility and your feet are weak. But if your feet are strong and you got great ankle mobility, like you're going to feel more connected barefoot than you will with shoes when you do exercises for your lower body. So I think it's similar uh, with gloves. And if you're just starting out and that and calluses don't matter to you, you're like, whatever, if I get calluses, I get calluses. I would argue do it without gloves because I feel like if you do something for a long time with gloves, it'll be hard to transition versus starting out without gloves and doing it the whole time that way. Next question is from Honey Cell. Is low weight and high reps not as effective as high weight, low reps? Yeah. Um, okay. First off, it depends. And let's let's start off by saying this. If we're talking about repetition ranges that are within reason, it doesn't make a huge difference. When I say within reason, I mean like if you're going like below 20 reps, uh, you know, anything below 20 reps, we're okay. Once you start to get to like 30, 40, 50, 60 reps, the problem, and there are studies that show like 50 reps will build muscle too, so long as mm-hmm. you, the intensity is really high. But here's the problem. Stamina and stability start to get in the way. So if I'm doing squats for 50 reps, 
what what'll what'll fail first is not muscular strength, but rather my stamina and my endurance, and that might make it more challenging to build muscle as a result, um, or you know your lung capacity starts to get in the way, um, and uh, and also just the just the, the the overall amount of just work. You know, I'm I'm doing a set for five minutes because I'm doing so many uh, repetitions, but if it's within reason, it doesn't make a huge difference, um, especially if you. If you phase, like mm -hmm. if you phase and you're doing, well, that's the that's the sweet sauce. That's it. That's the yeah. way to do it. You got to phase between. You got to do, uh, you know, a few weeks of higher repetitions, and a few weeks of lower repetitions, and you'll get more sustained, yeah. more consistent gains that way. We'll both have value, and it's this kind of just falls back into a lot of what we always talk about in terms of like whatever you're not doing. Um, will provide your body a new stimulus that you're going to, you know, have muscle building effects uh, provided uh, to you with. So yeah. um, that's just the thing. It's uh, there's there's no like set rep range that's always going to be consistently building you muscle. You have to you know consider that uh, you got to go through periods of of new stimulus to you know kind of reignite that response. Well, to that point. The reverse is actually even true on this based off of what you've been doing uh, most frequently. So the question is set up as is low weight and high reps not as effective as high weight, low reps. And the reverse could be true if all you ever do is high weight, low reps. Yep. If you always train low reps and high weight all the time and you never use lightweight, high reps, it'll actually be more effective to go lightweight, oh. high reps. So the, 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 the variable that is most important here is what have you been doing the most consistent or what is the most novel to the body? So if whatever it is that you haven't been doing, move into that. So that's, we get this kind of question all the time. It's just worded in different ways, you know, yeah, and it's, totally. it's, uh, it's all the same answer, which is the, the answer is that there's tremendous value. Sal says it all the time from zero reps to about 25 and everything in between that all have tremendous value for building muscle, burning body fat, sculpting the body, whatever you want to say. And the one that is going to be the best for that is the one that you're not doing. Yeah. So that's what you need to evaluate is what, what rep range do you neglect the most and move into that and you'll see the most value. And that is for building muscle, for burning body fat, for being stronger, all the above. Yeah. And now there's something that people often don't talk about, which are the mental benefits of training in these different uh, rep ranges and weights. It is a different mental state and feel to go do a set of four reps than it is to go and do a set of 14 reps. It's very different. Like higher reps, you're squeezing more, you're getting better pump, you know, you're, you're, you're stabilizing, you're, you're feeling the muscles more. Four reps, it's like you are, you are, you're firing your whole CNS, it's heavy, you're staying tight, you're driving, it's obviously a shorter set. It's a, they're totally different feels. And I think there's a lot of value in training all those different feels. It's a different mentality to go, and this is why I prefer phasing, you know, for three weeks at a time versus, you know, every other workout I change from high reps to low reps. Like I like to stay in a low rep phase because I like to stay in that mental state. And then I like to go in a high rep phase and stay in that mental state. Switching back and forth so often tends to throw me off a little bit in terms of, you know, what I'm going after and what I'm trying to feel uh, with the weight. So pay attention to that. It's, it's a totally different feel and it, it's a different mental, you know, different mental preparedness that you need before you go into the sets. And it's a different way you control the weight and a different way that you lift the weight when you go heavy versus light. Next question is from bag double zero MBA. Are mirrors an underrated piece of gym equipment? Mirrors. You know, what's funny <laughs> is we think that mirrors are, I think a lot of people think mirrors in the gym, just so you can look at yourself and check yourself out while you're working. Most you know, people think that I would assume the, the reality is a mirror is a very valuable piece of exercise equipment because unless you have a trainer or a coach watching your form, you oftentimes feel like you're moving a particular way and you're not. Like I all the time. Yes. Like like for me, for example, shoulder press is a big one because I I had left my left shoulder, I had my AC joint resected years ago. So I always have to be careful to make sure that my right and my left are balanced. And if I don't press in front of a mirror, inevitably I have a slightly, it's just a little different between the right and left. And I can't tell, I can't tell when I'm not looking in the mirror. I, I can't feel it. I have to look in the mirror and then actively bring one shoulder down to, to match. So, and that's what mirrors are for. Watch your form critically, make sure that you're symmetrical and things are moving the way they should. 
um, and, and, and balance things out because oftentimes the way you feel doesn't necessarily accurate. Yeah, it's interesting. It was a it was definitely a shift when I didn't have a mirror when I'd squat because I was definitely dependent a lot on um, the mirror to to be able to dictate um, those little nuances of oh, oh you know when I drop down a little bit on one side versus the other or you just see visually uh, some of these discrepancies as you're going down to the squat I would slow way down and really watch myself and then you know taking that away um, you, you did find well I found myself uh, getting into the momentum of the squat a lot of times and having to check myself um, to, uh, you know, to really pay attention and to really feel all of those, um, different, uh, type of imbalances starting to form. So, um, I, I do find they're very valuable. It's kind of comical because you're such an anti life I hate the mirror at the same time yeah. because of the fact of all these people getting in front and just constantly doing the flex posing <laughs> stuff. Uh, but it, it really does. Um, I caught you one time. I, I mean, I do. I, I do it just like anybody else. Yeah. I talk shit, but it's it's because I'm guilty of yeah. doing some of those things too. If I get a good pump, you or just whatever. don't do it in front of everybody. Never. Yeah. Just in the bathroom. Yeah. yeah just yeah. always in the bathroom. I, you know, I actually think this is uh, um, almost a silly question. I, don't, I, I think it's pretty obvious, but I think there's a stigma around the mirrors. Like, I think that there's this uh, this idea, especially if you're a- Yeah, a, it's a stereotype, right? Yeah, there's a total stereotype around using the mirror that it's this narcissistic bodybuilder or woman's competitor that loves to look at themselves all the time. And of course, that exists, but I don't think that was the- actual evolution of the mirror in the gym. I don't think it was, let's put mirrors in here for all the narcissistic people to stare at themselves. Like, <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious that, it, you know, if you don't have a trainer or you don't have a partner who is actually trained in biomechanics or can help you mm -hmm. with your form, the mirror is the next best thing. Or now using like your phone to video yourself. And so that's the other thing too. Mm -hmm. Like I know we're quick to judge somebody who pulls their phone out and is recording because it looks silly because of, you know, we're making fun of influencers and that, but I've used my phone many times uh, to record myself, not because I want to make a cool video of myself, you know, or post it later on. It's because I'm watching my technique mm -hmm. and I'm being hypercritical of my movement. And even the mirror isn't enough feedback. I, I get a little bit of feedback in front of me, but I want to see behind me or yeah. I want to see the side yeah. of me. And I want to, uh, watch it and critique it and then go back to the drawing board and adjust. And so I think mirrors have tremendous value and especially if you're someone relatively new. Now, I think I can train today. Uh, and in fact, my garage has no mirrors. So when I train in my own garage, I don't have a mirror in my garage and mm -hmm. I'm completely fine. It's Do not, the workouts even count though? Yeah, that's right. They may not even count, you know? <laughs> so I don't think it's necessary for an advanced lifter to have to have a mirror, but Man, I think they're I think they're very valuable. It's just it's just funny because once you get, once you get a recruitment pattern in your body, something that you do very often, it feels normal. Mm -hmm. So if one foot pronates, but that's how you always squat. When you get into position and squat, it's going to feel very balanced and normal because this is how you your body moves. So you're not going to notice unless you really. That's a big one for me. When I squat, if I look at myself right, straight ahead, I watch my feet because that's where I notice the difference and I'm yep. paying attention closely. In fact, one time. I worked out at a gym. I thought this was brilliant. I don't see this being a popular thing though, but it, I thought it was very smart. The mirror had um, lines. So it had like a few vertical lines that were straight and they were perfectly straight. And then a few horizontal lines so that when you're lined up in the mirror, you you have these kind of these markers and you can see one shoulder is a little higher than the other in, in relation to the, the lines that were on the mirror. Mm -hmm. It was really, really cool. I don't see it being a popular thing because I think it, it, you know people rather look at a mirror without any distractions on it, but no, it's a, it's a very valuable piece of equipment. I think if you have a home gym, you probably should put a mirror in there at least where you do complex lifts in front of. Maybe yeah. not your isolation exercises, but if you're squatting and overhead pressing and deadlifting and stuff like that, that'll record it. Well, you know? you're I always going to go to your default movement patterns uh, to that point, and and I don't think that a lot, a lot of people realize like how far away that can get. Uh, sometimes if you haven't been critically analyzing yourself and, and, you know, going through the technique and the movement of it, it's, it's very helpful to get feedback either from a coach or be able to see it visually. Totally. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal and Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam.